All right. So we have Rabbi Moshe Perry. Moshe, where do you live? Los Angeles, California. So we had a brief discussion about Rabbi Meir Kahana, and I think that's a character who has been lost in Jewish history. Many people don't speak about him. I don't think the average Orthodox Jew knows about him nowadays, especially in America. That's true. It's unfortunate. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Yeah, well, he was, uh, as some people know, he was born in Brooklyn, New York. He uh, grew up to found the JDL. And then shortly after, three years later, in 71, he made Aliyah, where he continued being an advocate and an activist for Kali Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Jewish people, and Torah, teaching Torah, writing, proficient writer. And he founded the Kach Party and really went a long way with that, uh, growing from nothing and embarrassing losses in Israeli parliamentary or Knesset uh, races to really threaten the uh, powers that be uh, that he would be the third largest party if he was allowed to run in 1988. And they thought of a, an ex- flimsy excuse to ban him and because uh, they were afraid of him. He had a Approximately then, 200,000 votes he was looking forward to, which would have meant 10 to 12 seats at the at that time uh, during those uh, years of the Knesset's rules. And it would have only grown from there because the whole sub-generation, not yet uh, in the Army, not at 18 in the high schools, especially among the Spartan, were all Kahana. He was going to have 400,000 before long. He was coming to part of the same way Menachem Begin came to power. And it would have been only a matter of time, and the Israeli government couldn't stop him through their legal means. They tried everything they could once he had one seat in the Knesset to bar him from television and radio and and do all sorts of programming, even within the army, which is supposed to be totally politically neutral, to try and Mm -hmm. convince them not to uh, be uh, be in favor of Merikahana's in favor of uh, you know positions. politically, etc., and they had to use extra legal means to get him out. Right, America Hanna's big beef with the Orthodox community started in New York. There's a famous statement he made of every Jew of 22 when uh, Ramosha Feinstein gave this, this weird pasak that Jews in Brooklyn should walk around with a $10 bill in their sock so they could have something to give to the mugger. That's what America Hanna said every Jew of 22. Yeah, uh, Rabbi Merikahana had few uh, conversations, actually, with Rabbi Moshe Feinstein when he was uh, advocating, especially for Soviet Jewry. But in answer to your question, I remember the issue. I'm from Los Angeles, and I wasn't a party to all this going on in Brooklyn and in New York. There's a problem with carrying in the Arab on Shabbat. There's no such thing as an Arab. Or the, it, it wasn't uh, certainly in Brooklyn. It wasn't doable. 600,000 people on Ocean Parkway or whatever, and uh, so you couldn't really make an error, so the question is, a lot of Jews were being asked and harassed and mugged on and Shabbos walking around, so they asked if they're allowed to carry a gun, and they were told no, it's muksa, and I guess even, I guess that means, I have to look into the issue more, I guess that means even if they are wearing a holster, which is considered really actually you're not carrying what's in the holster, you're wearing it, but maybe you, you would say even though you're wearing the holster, that doesn't mean you're wearing the gun. And the advice was to give the mugger something so that he won't harm you out of frustration. And it seemed pretty weak and pretty cowardly, and I don't know if people did it or not, but there were definitely people who I think defied what uh, Rabbi Feinstein uh, Zechut Bracha said and carried a gun for their own protection because it's Pekuch Nefashas. It's, it's a point of, uh, Jews were being really severely, uh, hurt. I don't know if anyone was actually killed. I, it's too long ago. I don't, I don't remember the history of this issue. But he also talked to Rabbi, uh, Rav Moshe, uh, when, when the Soviet issue came up. And, uh, he, I think, even had previously talked to him when the, just the JDL was around and had just come on board with uh, their policies to help the primarily uh, elderly 
that are walking around exposed in certain neighborhoods of Brooklyn or other places uh, in Boston and in Philadelphia and New Jersey. And uh, so, so Ramosha's, I remember reading, uh, Romero quoted it in his book, uh, The JDL Story. He, he says, so Ramosha said to me, uh, try not to become what you're fighting against. That was a quote Ramosha said to him. On the other hand, when it came to the Soviet Jewry, and lots of students, Bahrain and the yeshivas, wanted to rush out and protest and be involved in this issue. It caught their fancy. It, it excited them to be an activist for Torah, for, for Torah and for Jews in trouble around the world and not to stand idly by Lo Tamod al Dam Reacha. So the, the Rabbanim, the Gedolim in, in, in New York were worried that they're going to lose their kids uh, it's going to lead to uh, have carers and they're not going to learn so well anymore, and they didn't want to lose them. So they fought bitterly against this and refused to allow them to go out to the point where it became an issue that they were going to rebel against the rebunning. And I had a mm -hmm. recent conversation with a friend who's uh, a colleague, but he's more of a mentor uh, here in L.A., who said we were all in, on Americana side, we're just too afraid to to cross our rabbis, and we were too afraid really to go out there and get beaten up, or, you know, to mix it up with mm -hmm. blacks or whatever. We were afraid. We admit to mm -hmm. our being afraid. But getting back to this issue, he finally, Ramosha said, "We're going to lose the kids. We have to make a large uh, kinesia, a large uh, gathering, and we're going to say to Hillam for Soviet Jewry, but we're not protesting. We're not causing America any grief. We're not causing the Soviet Jew Union any grief. We are just davening for our brethren. And Ramir said, that's great. I don't care what you do, as long as you're involved, mm -hmm. right? Anything helps. And, and, and he had said that to his Rosh Yeshivas in the mirror where he learned for 13 years. He said, well, not one time. They also said to him, you're in a bad way and you're turning out bad and you're going to be in trouble mm -hmm. and you're going to do things wrong. And he said to them, okay, fine, let's say I'm wrong. I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Why in the whole 13 years that I was here, we never stood up and said one capital to Hillam for the Soviet Jews who were trapped in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union and dying a spiritual holocaust. Mm -hmm. So that was the issues mm -hmm. back then uh, in the JDL in, in New York. And even all this was before he immigrated to Israel. I think he was, yes, was yes. Michael King back then, right? And I well, think no, he was Michael, Michael King is before his involvement with uh, being a rabbi in 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 Far Rockaway, Queens, uh, or out on the island, and uh, before he went to the Jewish press, where he found out about the problem of the muggings and everything that made him want to start JDL. Michael King was a political thing he was doing before. Uh, all of this, but let me just finish the issue of the Soviet Jewry, uh, at least this part of it. Um, also, Torah Vadas, one Motsi Shabbos, held an all-night vigil in the base medrash, where they were learning for Soviet Jewry, dedicating their learning for the uh, sh to Hashem to save Soviet Jewry. And while it was going on, that Motsi Shabbos, in 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 the back of the, the back entrance came Merikan and learned a few hours. And he, he later said, I'll do anything for the cause. This is fine. This, this is what they want to do. I'll join in, in, in their idea of what will help, because it will help learning Torah and davening or whatever for Soviet Jewry. But at least they're, they're concentrating their effort. Their, 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 their kavana is to direct their actions to save their brethren. So if he didn't expect all of them to rush the barriers at the UN or the Russian mission and try and get arrested and what caused a hubbalo, which he held was the only way to get the, the issue really moving. Obviously, you daven and learn is going to be great in Shemayim, but if you want to move the issue among the people, the American government, the Soviet government, you've got to really get the story on page one. You've got to do what is necessary to get it off the back pages or on the no pages where it's not covered at all mm -hmm. as a non-issue to the most uh, uh, Jews and Gentiles all over the country here in New York that they, they would ignore it and had been ignoring it, in his opinion, for since 1917, since 50, mm -hmm. 50 years till then. Uh -huh. 
Did you ever attend one of his summer camps? I heard the JDL as an option for sending kids up in the Catskills. They created a, a summer camp training kids how to fire rifles and uh, survival skills. My good friend Mike Kozowski from Kafartopok used to run it before he made all the Yeah, your QTL, yeah. I saw videos of him of these camps from way back. I personally, I was I was younger. When I was born in 1956, and I grew up a secular a Jew here in L.A., uh, and uh, my bar mitzvah was in 69, to just tell you where I was, uh, 13 years old. I didn't know any of this at the time. I guess I'd heard of the JDL because people talked about it out here. There became a chapter out here with Robert Manning and Irv Rubin, Rubin and uh, I, I tangentially heard about it. I wasn't involved. I was My sole involvement was... Uh, was getting my bar mitzvah in 1969, uh, so I went to Talmud Torah for a few years, and I also, um, my parents did a few things in the house, Hanukkah, Pesach, whatever, uh, and uh, Rosh Hashanah, and um, my my other involvement was the Six-Day War. We did a whole big current event thing in my class, my fifth grade class, me and a friend put together a whole thing. So I started to become a little bit aware of, of being Jewish and, and Israel's existence and what that meant, even though I'd heard about it, I didn't concentrate, it wasn't part of my uh, world view at the time when I was 11 years old in 67. However, uh, when I grew up, though, I was very liberal. And just a little bit about myself. I won't go into the whole issue. Maybe another time or whenever you want. Most but Jews. I, I think most Jews. I was, yeah, I was a poster child for what it meant to be in the '60s a liberal Jew here in LA in, in the United States. And and uh, you know, I grew up to even when I became religious. I was at UCLA in the early '70s, and I found interest in Judaism. I want and interest in Israel. I wanted to go to Israel. And I ended up there in uh, Or Sameh, who was my yeshiva that I went to. And I became religious. But even though I became religious, I, I wasn't necessarily politically changed as much. Uh, maybe a little bit more, I guess you'd say, conservative or right-wing, but really still liberal. And uh, it took a long uh, metamorphosis for me to get to the point where I embraced the ideology of Rabbi Kahana. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole story in itself. Uh, so the way I got introduced to JDL, I was learning in Aish, also in Israel. I learned a little also in Osemech. There were some students there who got a group of guys together to go down to Kafar Tapuach and train dogs and get involved in Israel and religious Zionists from that perspective. I remember we also did a search and recovery of bodies and stuff like that in the Shamron. Wow, uh, I didn't know this. And, That's great. Yeah, I didn't have no idea. And, um, um, and that's where I met Yekutiel, Mike Ozovsky, there in Kapartapuach, um, and Ezra Stein and all the other guys. I remember when I was there, it was when Eden was there. And I don't know if you know about that whole ordeal, but yeah. And I think I also met Mike before that. He used to have a internet cafe on Yafo, but it's a Hanama Kazit. I think that's how I met him with Rup Chaim. actually ran Kahana.org for about eight years. And although I'm not a Kahanist, but I support a lot of what they do, what would you say is the biggest difference between a Kahanist and a Merkaza Rob style religious Zionist? The average religious Zionist who's not a Kahanist isn't willing to confront the government over annexing the territories and and removing the Arabs from Eretz Israel. They're willing to entertain that the government may have other answers or solutions that will, will work. And even though we've seen all the things not work in Oslo, and we should be convinced, all of us, that nothing will work with these people, uh, they're still holding out and they're too afraid for themselves or whatever to confront the government or the Jewish establishment leaders here and their rabbis in shuls and be ostracized or looked down upon I basically have had to go it alone because they, I'm uh, not just a conist. I'm not in the closet. I'm far, far from that. I'm way out there. And so as a result, people think I'm crazy or a fanatic or what. Like they said about Mayor Khan. And even though he died and even though his books are out there and you can read them and see how logical they are now based on Torah, every single syllable out of his mouth is based on, on, on principles of Judaism. Some concepts of Torah that came from Hashem when we taught to Klai Israel, they still refuse to acknowledge it as being the truth. Not only did he die, he was murdered. And yes. one statement I remember that uh, 
Mike Zazowski told me he made to him was that he knew that he was going to be murdered, but his greatest fear was to be murdered by a Jew. And, uh, and in Eretz Yisrael. And in Eretz right, Yisrael. Right. He didn't want to be murdered there. And he didn't want to be murdered by a Jew because it's not a Kiddush Hashem, all that. It's, it's right. less of a Kiddush Hashem. He want, if he Which is what happened with Rabin. All, right. right. The understanding was that it was a setup, the execution of Rabin. There were also stories about goons paid by the government to beat up Merkahana. That once she was walking down a corner down, I think, Yafo, somewhere near Shalim, and then these guys in masks came. Don't call, with, don't with call them goons. Yeah. Don't call them goons. They're from the Shabak. Identify who they are. They're, they're, they're legitimate people in the government or attached to the government that they use. It's not just mm-hmm. some thugs that they hire and give a, give a few shekels to. These are real mm-hmm. agents that did all this. So it's the Israeli equivalent to the CIA, I guess, or to some... And the FBI, whatever, whichever. Uh Mossad is CIA, Shabak is FBI. There's many people who blindly defend Israel and uh, don't know how cutthroat their actual policies and government really is. And I think that's the biggest distinction I would make between a Kahanist and a, a regular religious Zionist. The Kahanist is not a traditional Zionist. He wants to see Israel completely religious, but Ultimately, free of Arabs. I mean, I think that was the biggest free of issue. Arabs, land annexed, Jews permitted to live wherever they can and want. All of Eretz Israel that was liberated by Hashem in the Six Day War in '67. That's what a Kahanist mm-hmm. wants. That's what Merak Kahana and Benjamin Kahana wanted. They wanted to have the land that God liberated become the Jewish people's land. And even if it's not a Torah government yet, because you need a majority and you work within the democratic process till Mashiach comes, still we're going to do everything we can to show Hashem that we're maximizing our appreciation of the Kiddush Hashem and the nace that he did in 67 to save all of Am Yisrael and Klai Yisrael there from being obliterated and exterminated which was their goal. Their goal wasn't just to conquer the land back from the Jewish people. It was to eradicate every Jew there and shed every mm-hmm. Jew's blood. And so, therefore, we're spitting in God's face, Mayor Khan has said, Rabbi Khan has said, every time we give part of the land or negotiate or show our willingness, we're spitting in Hashem's face and saying, take your miracles and, and, and get out of here, Binyamin said. Take your miracles and get lost. We, 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 we don't need you. We don't need your miracles. Leave us alone. We want to be going. That's what Marikana held is the Arab Rav government of Eretz Yisrael. And a, a, a non-traditional uh, uh, religious Zionist can get away with saying that. The real, traditional religious Zionists are too afraid to say that. Either they are not willing to agree with that statement or they are afraid to agree with it publicly. Mm-hmm. Now, the main sugya used by anti-Zionists to confront this whole ordeal is Masachet Ketuvot, the three oaths, the famous three oaths. 111a, yes. I'm just rereading that chapter. It's funny you should mention. I'm just in the middle of rereading that. I began it last night late, rereading that chapter in uh, Jewish Idea by Rav Meir. So So, I'm pretty current. I'm a big advocate for separating Halakha from Agatha. Right, and this is one of the areas that those who typically fail to make a distinction between Midrash and Halakha always make this distinction, especially like if they align themselves with Israel. Right. They're like, oh, well, this is just a Midrash, you can't take it seriously. But I think that a Midrash stops just remaining a Midrash when it aligns itself with the Torah principle. According to Torah itself, when Hashem puts you in Galut, it's really up to him to pull you out of Galut. And this is what the argument made by Satmer, and I'm not even mentioning the Torah Karta, you know, people were just genuine anti-Zionists without supporting the threat or marching alongside the Arabs and the terrorists. Yeah. yeah what do you say that, at least according to Rashi's rendition of the three oaths, that one of the oaths is breaching the walls of Jerusalem and even warring against nations there, wouldn't that also go against the Torah principle of waiting till Hashem actually pulls you out of Galut? Right. So, um, Romero talks about in this chapter, he says, first of all, we don't paskin halacha by Agadita. That's the first thing he said. Right. Even though I right. found out from somebody 
been in Grismila and a couple of other areas, we very well might Paskin and Halakha or two about Grismila and maybe some other Halakha, I forgot which one, from an Agadita. So he might not be totally correct about that. Just in general, he's correct. Uh, it's not a, a halachic uh, statement in the Gomorrah when they're quoting an Agadita. Uh, some things are, are true literally and some things are figuratively, and you have to have a Kabbalah to know what which is which in Medrash. Or Agadita, the son of the Rambam, Rav Avram ben, My, uh, ben Moshe, um, said if you believe all the Madrashim and all the Agadita are literal, to the T, uh, to the nth degree, you're a fool. And if you believe none of them are literal, then you're an apicorist. But in mm-hmm. general, this is uh, Romero's approach is, and I have a chiddush that I wish he was alive for me to tell him on this point that he, I think he would uh, really appreciate and 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 and, and embrace. Um, he said that it's a contract. You look at it; it's three oaths, but two are for the Jewish people. And one is for the, the nations of the world, the Goyim. One, uh, the two for us are we won't arm ourselves mm-hmm. and invade Eretz Israel, the Choma, rise up like a wall, young mass, and rush back to conquer the land. He goes mm-hmm. on to say, what does that mean? It means that God sent us out here, like he said. He sent us out here to, to do penance mm-hmm. and do tshuva for the sins that he kicked us out for. So until the time is uh, that a God agrees that we have done tshuva, we are to stay out. But that's only the mass claw Israel, not individual Jews who are allowed to go back anytime. Rabbi Yosef Karo did stop from going back and settled in spots. The, the Ramban went there to Israel and settled in Yerushalayim. The, uh, the Baal Shem Tov and the Gra both sent families to um, Israel. I mean, the vast they majority of anti-Zionists live in Israel. I don't think that's the issue. But one of the hopes is crowding in Israel or uniting in mass. Right. And okay, I think... So uh, that's what it means. So we, to, to invade right, so Maritana's approach was that because they broke one of the oaths, well, the non-Jews broke the oaths, well, they, uh, they in yeah, some way uh, abolished the contract. You know, yeah, so me, it allowed let us let me, to let break... Let me lay it out. Let me lay it out. So the first, con- the first oath was, was not to go back like a wall en masse. The second oath was not to stay among the Goyim and give them grief of trying to conquer their countries from them. So you'd have a place that you're in control of and not suffering from them their blows. Didn't mean we're not allowed to defend ourselves. We should have done far more defending ourselves in the Gullahs than we did. But that, that's history now. We're not going to debate that right now. So the two oaths that the Jewish people had to keep were, were not to invade Eretz Israel en masse till the time is right and, and not to make trouble uh, uh, killing the Goyim and attacking their countries where they are in the Gullahs. The third one is the oath that the nations of the world took not to over-oppress us, not to over-persecute us, and if they didn't do over-persecution at the time of the Crusades and the Inquisition, they certainly did by the Holocaust, Ramirez said. So they breached the contract, so it's buckle. And therefore, just like any other contract, if I make an agreement with you, we're both going to invest $10,000 and do the bucket this thing and our business or whatever, and, and I come to the day of the signing and the giving or after the signing, and I give the money, I give 2000 I say, no, on my end of the deal is only 2000 And when you protest, I slug you in the face. No judge in the world is going to say, because you signed on the deal, you've got to go through with it. It's breach of contract. He abrogated, I abrogated my part. You don't have to keep your part. So therefore, the gun broke their part. We don't have to keep our part anymore. And I add on to that. In 1947-48, when the state of Israel came online, that's the end of the Gullahs. These oaths were for the Galut for the period of time, for 2,000 years, that we were in exile. Now that the Reish Smith is Gullah Seno, the start, not the end. We have to earn the end. But the start, God was giving to us for several reasons to answer up. Satmar and Notori Karta, we can go into that at length if you want. But the, the Gullahs ended in 1948, and therefore those oaths are buckled even if the going didn't abrogate their, their end. Even if they hadn't, but they certainly had by the Holocaust. And therefore it's mm-hmm. over. We don't have to keep it anymore. Hashem doesn't hold it to us. He's not going to let us be totally successful if we're still sinners, and Hashem wants us to do tshuva mm-hmm. in the Gullahs. But he has already started the process of the beginning of the redemption, the final redemption, the Gula Shlema, and therefore it's a new Tukufa, and therefore mm-hmm. 
They go so slowly end over the last 70 years. It's slowly been ending in different places in the world, and that's where we're holding right now. Therefore, we're not bound by these oaks anymore, and that's what I would tell the summer of if he were here today. Right. We weren't bound by them to begin with. Cause, I mean, cause there were, Even if we were, because they were, they right. were madrushing. Right. They're okay. not madrushing. But, they're not madrushing. They're in the Gomorrah. They're in the Talmud. They're a Gadotah. Right, so they're in the Talmud, okay. in, the, okay. in the Talmud is where all the halakhas are. So these are closer to halakha than madrushing that are part of the oral law of 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 Torah of Ixtav and Tanakh. You're thinking of Midrash Rabbah. I mean, any yeah, Midrash in the Gemara is just called the Gadata. Yeah, okay. It's a technical point. Medrash is connected to Torah Shabbat and Agadita is connected to Torah Shabbat Peh. There may be Medrashim saying the same thing as something in a Gomorrah, but it's it's different Mandi Omrim and it has a different status. And the question is whether it's halacha or not, or can be considered halacha. The reason I think the three O's carry a bit more weight is because they're reiterating a Torah principle. And the Rambam really made it famous in his Agar to Tehman. Right, you know, because there was a similar yeah. movement in his time of some messianic figure driving people to Israel, and then he brings down the three O's, he even ties it into a Shira Shirim, and it sounds like he's understanding it as an actual chova, not to violate it. Waiting, waiting for Mashiach, what? or waiting till Hashem, uh, uh, I, I read the Yagaris Teman, I just don't remember that passage in it. That wasn't what the Yagaris Teman was primarily about. The Yagaris Teman was a letter written to him. By the, the 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 Jews there saying we're being persecuted, are we allowed to do uh, a fake conversion to Islam to save ourselves from being killed by the by the Muslims? And he went through a whole treatise there saying, no, you're not. You have to give up your life. These are the bitter times. These people are the worst enemies we've ever had in history. And he went through the whole thing. That's why I don't remember clearly it in Igeris Teman. Maybe he wrote it in some other Igeret. Or maybe it's a part of that again. I just don't at this point. No, I'm pretty sure it was there. Okay. okay. There was a messianic figure don't. in Yemen. Yeah, there was. There was. Uh, there was. Right. Arguing that they should in some way charge Israel or go there in mass. And then he said, don't arouse God's love before it's time, quoting right. Sher Shirim. Sure, sure, and then he yeah. brings them. Right. Okay. So the um, Rambam, the Rambam wasn't but, holding in the Tukufa of... of uh, the Rambam wasn't holding the Kufa of, of the Geula yet. He was in the 1100s, and he himself tried to live in Eretz Israel right. after he had to flee Spain. It did, he did, for sure, he well, the issue is not living in Eretz Israel. It's controlling. Like it. it's Hopmer, it you know, the, it's taking uh-huh. it over. Well, but I, um, I don't have an answer because it's tied into a Torah principle towards for the end of Sefer Devarim and Sefer Vayikra. It lays out the formula for exile and redemption, and nowhere there does it in any way show the Jews uniting and marching out of Galut in mass. In other okay. words, so that's why I think it carries however, a little more weight. However, there is Gomorrahs, there's four of them, one in Sota, one in Yuma, one in, I'm trying to remember, uh, Sanhedrin, uh, four places in the Shas where the, the Torah takes the Jews of Bovo to task for not having come back in the second uh, Aliyah, the second base of Mikdash, after the 70-year exile was over, unmasked. They did not get up and leave. Therefore, A, they had to wait for permission from Koresh Cyrus, who took over from the, uh, the Persians conquered the, the, the uh, Babylonians. And because they had done the sin with Nebuchadnezzar's uh, idol, and they had done the golden calf in the Midbar, the Chazal say that's why Hashem made it, that they couldn't um, they couldn't uh, either succeed or even come up with the idea to come back en masse. But had they done that, had they gone en masse like they were supposed to, with permission, without permission, now the permission part is is they would have been able to get up without anybody, any goy telling them anything, king or not king, king of the world or not king of the world. They would have marched there to Israel and nothing, nobody would have laid a hand on them because no, 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 no. Pachet of Hashem would have been out there had they not done these other <laughs> sins, these other type of of, of communal mm-hmm. national sins. But they were mechui. Once they had permission, they were obligated to go back, and they did, and they failed. And the Gomorrahs, those four Gomorrahs say, they all say, had they done what they were supposed to do, Hashem would have made this the final Geula. Second base of Mikdash would have been the final base of Mikdash. And they, the... Um, 
the uh, the miracles that Yoshua saw would have been seen by them, and all their enemies would have run away, etc. Mm-hmm. But there is so, an answer that Americana gives to Satmar and everybody as to why it should be. His question is, or he, he terms it, that the Satmar Rav's question, and I have co- corroboration on this, that the Satmar Rav is not worried about the th- three oaths. Maybe his Hasidim are. Maybe his followers were. And that was their argument. And there are people who argue with me and say, no, it is the three oaths. I asked the Rav in Orson Mayak, when I was uh, walking to the Satmar Rebbe's Hesped, he was buried in America, but they held in Meisharim, they held a, uh, a eulogy for him. And I was walking with this very uh, huge guddle. Uh, uh, his name was is Reb Mordechai Isby. And I asked him, what's Satmar's problem with Eretz Yisrael? What was his problem with the, was it the three O's? And he said, no. He said, the, the, the problem the Satmar Rav held, he held it was such a chil of Shem for, for Jews to own the land and have to be Mekayim out of fear or whatever reason, world opinion, to have Mekayim Batia Vodazor all over the land under their auspices as the, as the, uh, as the governing body of the land, that it's better we don't have the land. Mm-hmm. That's what he held. And so obviously the, the, uh, that's what so, he held according to this route. But wait, wait a minute. So Ramerikana said, Rev, the, the, the real question that Satmar Rav had is that Yosh, Moshe and Yeshua are great Jews, so of course conquering Eretz Yisrael was the right thing to do, and it's from God, and it's from Hashem, and of course it's the right thing to do. Ezra and Nehemiah in the second basin, these are great Jews, Tzadikim, Tahorim, uh, big, uh, big lump down, so of course Hashem is with them. This is a Misa Sutton, Ben Gurion, Chaim Weissman. This is ridiculous. This is Rishayim. Of course, Hashem's not there. It's a Misa Sutton. Even when they win miraculous wars, etc., it's not Mashiach. It's not the Geula. It's nothing Kodesh. So Remer has an answer, and he says that you're wrong. He says, Yechezkel 36 says clearly that Hashem is going to take you back for my sake, not for your sake. I'm sick of my name being dragged through the mud of the Chil Hashem of you living in the Gullahs. I'm going to get sick of it in Gullahs, and I'm going to start the process even though you don't deserve it. The Goyim are going to deserve it for what they did to you that angered me at the Chil Hashem they caused by killing you off all over the place. And all the Goyim saying, look at this, their God, he's dead or he's, he's impotent or whatever. He doesn't exist anymore. And that's Chil Hashem I'm not going to be able to tolerate, and I'm going to take you back. And so it doesn't matter, it's despite their being restoring these Jews, that Hashem just got sick of it, and the Cheskel prophesied it 2,500 years ago, there will come a time when I'll take you back for my sake, to start the Gula, not to finish it. To finish it, we have to deserve it, or as you can see, historically, over the 100, 100 or plus years, we've been suffering terrible, terrible tragedies because we're not doing tshuva, Sorry, we're I'm not right. coming back in mass, and we're not being able to... Uh, uh, realize the final Gula yet. So let's put this all in historical context. For your husband, your Miyahu, these were Nevi'im who were prophesying during the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, in but other words, prophesying what, okay, hold on, for hold on. the future. Okay, hold on. Well, the reason they were raised up as prophets at this time was to comfort Israel and try to get them to do tshuva in Bavel so they could return. Even though... No, no. Your meow was trying to get them to do tshuva so there wouldn't be a korban. Part know, of his nevuos, but that's the only part of his nevuos. He's okay. got 40, 50 His paper is split in two. One, that before they go on to Galus, and with the second part, when they're already in Galut. It says, what towards the end of his safer, that Hashem decreed 70 years that they should be in bubble. After the 70 years, well, they could have just picked up and left. Hashem pushed Cyrus to get the ball rolling. But, I mean, that's a big lahabdil compared to how the state of Israel was founded by a bunch of let, communist let me, let me, let me clear one thing. atheist I'll, Jews. I'll address uh, myself to that point. Let me just say one thing. Yirmiyahu and Yeshaya and Yechezkel and all of the Nevi'im that are in the Tanakh, there were a million or more Nevi'im all over Eretz Yisrael in the thousand years we were there. And, the, or, or I guess in the first basic mission, yeah, a thousand years, 400, the time of the Shof team, and 400 more in time of the first basic mission, there's 420, uh, 410. Um, so there were millions of Nevi'im. 
The only ones recorded are ones that we need their prophecies for all time. You see the end of Yechezkel. You see the end of about what the third base of Mishra looks like. You see the end of Yirmiyahu and Yeshai when he's prophesying in the future 2,500 years, 3,000 years, what is going to happen to the world, <laughs> to the Goyim, not just to the Jewish people. He's talking about Nevoas that are remain now. I can point to one about the Iraq War. The two are hold on, hold on. wars. Go for it. So how do you know that Yehuskel was prophesying for the third base of Mikdash when he was yes, alive, sir. but the second one but wasn't even built yet? Right. In other words, the and idea because, is yeah. because he yeah, gave right. uh, okay. improper measurements, and we're not allowed to even include with the vast majority of Sefer Yehuskel and the majority of the Haftar we read nowadays because of that. Because it was questionable. It shows that Rabbi Kiva was arguing that it should be considered books that were mita meyadayim because of all the errors within it. But, I mean, I'm of the opinion that their Nebua was for the time and place that they lived in. Uh, but anyways, that's not what it's That's fine. We still have to make a huge distinction, a big lahavdil between Ezra and Nehemiah's Gola and what we see happening in 1948 with a bunch of atheist Jews that would steal that. babies and cut off payot uh, off yes, from people. I and uh, I definitely agree with you. However, Reb Mayer says they have a good question. Satmar Rav had a great question. I have a good answer. And you look at Yechezkel 36, and you see that Hashem is announcing, not for your sake am I going to do this. I'm going to do it for my sake. Because I'm sick of my name being desecrated in the gullus by you. I'm going to make you come back there to Israel, and I'm going to, through you here, slowly but surely make my name elevated and consecrated and, 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 and sanctified through you. Those words are there through you and Rameer and his videos. He, two great videos, by the way, online. Uh, one is called Why Be Jewish? And one is called The Yoke of Heaven. In one of those, he goes through this Yechezkel 36 paradigm. And he says it's a big mistake to say this isn't the hand of Hashem. That's why we can say hello on Yom Atzmut and Yom Yerushalayim because we're, say, we're saying it for the sake of Hashem, what he did. We're just vowing the rishis of the, of the Gentile, Jewish Gentiles that are running the show here. It's despite them, Hashem still did these miracles. So we have to associate ourselves with them and acknowledge them and show appreciation for us to for them while we fight the government to stop having uh, kfira and, and, and policies that go against the Torah and we have to get the Jewish people to a safe place where the Torah law is the law of the land like Hashem wants it and we have to resist and struggle against them mm -hmm. but at the same time things that the army is the hand of Hashem still even though they've usurped it and use it for the wrong purposes a lot of the time mm -hmm. and, 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 and they usurp the throne of Hashem in, in Yerushalayim to have the Knesset and the, the secular laws prevail Mm -hmm. especially when those secular laws go against the Torah. The, the, mm -hmm. These are issues that, that, that Romero was able to divide. He wasn't like the Kuknicks, who everything that the Israeli government can do no wrong. This is a, Everything they do is, is somehow siyata d'shmaya and, and fine. And he's not like the, the Satmar, that everything they do is a Misa Satan, and Hashem is not Makaimid. Because I have a very simple question. If Hashem does not agree with this, why did he let them survive? He should have, in 48, not 67, when a lot of innocent Jews would have been slaughtered. But in 48, just let the whole thing collapse. How many Jews were I'm sorry for them. Hashem wouldn't have made mm -hmm. the climate. If, if the it was 70 was years is like a drop in the bucket in the time span of Jewish history. And if you acknowledge that the Jewish state is basically run by non-Jews, how like, could it be the actual gurul unfolding the like the first flourishings of the Messianic age, if it's still run by non-Jews. says, the Gras says that, that they are, um, the Gras says that the Jewish government that will be at the end of uh, of time, and of Sefer called Tor, Kola Tor, the call, yeah. the voice of the turtle dove, he says. But I think it's a forgery, by the way. And yeah, I think, that's what uh, they say. like the vast majority of the Haredi to, world agrees. Yeah, I know. They think it's a forgery because they don't want to have to deal with the Bill Nagon being against them on, on America on his side. I'm sorry. It's a true safer. And, and I, I can back it, I can back it up with something the Gras wrote in, in his parish. Ruf Scheinberg, who was a Ruf Scheinberg, who's an Anico of the Gras. I know. With the secular relatives, the Rivlins, who pushed it. I mean, it was a safer that was found in the 60s, I believe, or late 50s. 
I mean, it seems it was very convenient when it appeared on the scene because Zionism, okay, well, Zionism that needed that religious that. push. Uh-huh. I'm not going to argue that because I don't know all of that. But I do know there is a Rabbi Khan. He was is in Asia Torah still, I believe, from YU, New York, who gave a great cheer on Yom Atzmud and Yom Yushalayim. And on Ari Shir Khan. Omar. Ari Khan. He gave a, 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 I talked to him personally I, when I discovered his lecture on the Sefir Omar, where he says the Gra, not in Kola Torah. And I want to get to the point of what is written in Kola Torah, but in a minute, you don't like it. So I'm going to quote something else that's in his Perush on Eitz Chaim, which is the uh, Rizal's Perush on the Zohar, I believe. Eitz Chaim. And he wrote a Perush where he said, and I quote, and the Chavetz Chaim said something very close to this also to the, to the Nazar of Yushalayim, uh, uh, David Cohen or Moshe Cohen back in the, in the 30s, late 20s, early 30s, uh, before the Chavetz Chaim died, he said something very similar to what the, the Gra says here. He, the Gra said, independent of that safer that you're challenging is not authentic. The Gra says Ari, uh, Ari Khan spoke in a shir it's online. You can find it from YU or probably Asia Torah also. Uh, YU New York. Anyway, he said that the Vilna Gaon said that on two dates during Sphir Omer in the future will be giant leap forward each one in their generation, two different generations, will be giant leaps forward in the Geula process. One will be on Yisod uh, Shabbat Ferris, on the 20th day of the Omer, which is the 5th of the Yar, which is Yom Atzmaut. And the other is, because he's talking about Mashiach ben Yosef was his big thing, that we need Mashiach ben Yosef first, and then will come Mashiach ben David. And uh, that's Ferris. In ER, Tferis Shaba, uh, Yesod Shabbat Tferis, the sixth day of that week, which is the 20th day of the Omer of the third week, and, and that'll be a, a giant leap forward. It just happened to be the fifth of ER in 1948. The second one, he said, will be a, a, even a bigger leap forward in the Gula process, and that'll be on Yesod Shabbat Malchus. I'm sorry, Malchus Shabbat Yesod on the 42nd in Eretz Shur, they celebrate Yom Yishlam on the 43rd day of the Svira, but it's really the 42nd, the Gras said, would be the Kodesh day that he knew from his learning, from his Yeruach HaKodesh, from however he knew it, to write it, and he had, it's written and recorded now in this Rav Shir, Rabbi Khan, that the Malchus should be so, the end of the sixth week, the 42nd day of the Omer, which is the 27th day of Er will also be Kodesh, so and be an even bigger leap forward, just happens to be the, the Six-Day War, the conclusion mm-hmm. of the Six-Day War. And this is spoken from the late 1700s by the Vilna Gaon, written down. Wait, yeah. To be fair, the Kolator no, wasn't claimed to be written by the Gra, no, but, but by his students. I know, but he, I know, I know, but I'm not talking Kolator now. I'm talking about a paper she wrote that a grandson of his wrote in Eretz Yisrael, wrote down the teachings of the Gra that his grandfather heard directly from the Gra. He wrote it in this book called Megala Amukos or something like that. And mm-hmm. it's in that book, and it's a parish of the Gra, not on Kolator, on, on, on what you're suspecting is not authentic, but on something else that is written by religious Jews that were descendants of the Talmudim, of the Vilna Gon, who the Vilna Gon sent to Eretz Yisrael to lead the vanguard of the Geula process that he held was already starting in his age that he would hoped would flower and expand back then. He came to the conclusion mm-hmm. it wouldn't, and he was very bitter about it and crying about it. His whole story is about the Nefshach Chaim of Chaim Velazhin, that he came in and he saw the Vilna Gon crying, and he says, Rebbe, why are you crying so much? And he says, because I, I, I realize I, I, see that, uh, I see that we're not going to be Zoha to, to come back pure Achishena uh, before it's time. We're not, it seems like we're only going to be able to come back, uh, Be'ita, which is a, a painful, nice. suffering process. And, and he said, I see all these Jews here. Little paper fuzz. 
pseudopigraphers, you know, books that they say are written by a certain person that we really can't verify. Really, I mean, shouldn't even carry that much weight. I mean, the Vonagon wasn't known as a big Makubo, and although he did write a parish to Zohar. He was, he right. was so big that people don't learn his parish on it. That's why they don't think of it as a big Makubo. That's, that's, that's a misnomer right there. The, the Vonagon was so much bigger, so much broader scientifically even than the whole Jewish world was prepared to accept the Torah world, that to this day they're afraid of the, what the Vilna Gon wrote. And yeah, so, so it's a uh, uh, different Kabbalah we have nowadays. I remind you, like, he put the first Lubav Jerebi in Harem. And, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, well, he stood off like in the Ramchal. He, he, okay. he seems like he did it with good good reason, how the latter Lubav Jerebi's movement has turned out now. He seems like okay. he had good cause, and he knew about I, it. And, I, I agree. I agree. So, I agree. And without getting into that issue right now. When I initially made Aliyah, I was more right-wing Zionist. And uh, after living in Israel for five years, I started adopting the teachings of Rabbi Yeshaya Leibowitz. Okay. His approach is more that he supports the state of Israel, but just like he supports England or, or India or any other democracy, but not because, like it says in Tefillah de Medina, that it's the first flourishings of the Messianic age or that the existence of the state is anything religious. Well, can you remind me who he is? He's the brother of Nechama Leibovitz. I mean, she oh. has a big... Uh, yes, yes, I know her works. Uh, yeah, uh, but where is he now today? He's Nifter now, but he was a professor when he were you. But uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. fine, okay, no, I mean, like, if you didn't... Uh, like, if you don't know no, who I, I heard the name, but I, I, there's Leibovitz that are associated with the big rub of uh, American Kabbalah time yeshivas, so I didn't know who you were referring to. Uh -huh. Okay, so as far as I know, uh, the statement you're making, that's what Romero said. He says, um, he, he says, to just recognize Israel after 2,000 years is just a phenomenon. It happens to exist, so we have to deal with it. And uh, don't read anything into it. He says, if you're going to be like that, to see all the miracles, especially in 67, when for two or three weeks beforehand, all the whole Arab world was up in arms and uh, pran dancing through the streets of Cairo and Damascus, just we're going to... These are Arabs. The <laughs> uh, I mean, the Arabs going through silly were, things to shoot themselves so in the foot. They were so convinced, they were so convinced they were going to wipe us out that time. And even the Israeli government were so worried, they were talking about, uh, maybe we'll hold on and win, maybe even by some miracle, but we're still going to suffer 50,000 lost citizens. Forget about troops. Uh, we're going to lose uh, half the country uh, 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 to deaths. Uh, we're going to be bombed from the air. We're gonna, they, they were they were worried. They thought it was the end. And certainly in '73, even though we didn't do so well as in '67, all because in Romero's opinion we didn't preempt like we should have, like we did in '67, would have been a different story. It was, it was criminal. It was vicious for Golda Meir and his her government not to do that. But separate issue. But they the, how they survived. It should have been a, a massive overrun. The Syrian tr uh, tanks the first day could have gone all the way to Tel Aviv. For some inexplicable reason, they stopped in their tracks and were afraid of something that they didn't, that they thought was out there that wasn't out there. I mean, these are miracles. These are Nisim that Hashem made happen. You, it, to see all these miracles, the Six Day War again, we had we were a fly on the back of the beast called the Islamic world, and they should have swatted us with their tail in not five minutes flat, flat, that they didn't, and that they suffered losses, and we liberated more land in the, that the Hashmanoim ever liberated in those six days, and not six years of war, six days of war. That's a, it's a, it's, he says that's not just disbelieving, that's disbelieving with... Uh, Can you say we... I mean, these are mainly secular Jews. I mean, no, Jews who, who we, I mean, no, Israel was initially founded as a communist country. I mean, all these people I understand, seen. but uh, I'm saying right. we, we, it's still the, the, the mm -hmm. land where the Jewish people call home, that have a nevuah from Avram Avinu's mm -hmm. time that this is our land and nobody right. else's land. And so uh, Jews mm -hmm. had hegemony on that land for the first time mm -hmm. in 2,000 years from 48, the wrong Jews, Erevrav descendant Jews, a terrible entity, but it's still Jews nonetheless, and therefore it's we. Okay. And if they get wiped out, it's an even bigger Kolosem than Jews getting wiped out in the Gullahs. But the point mm -hmm. I'm making, or the point Romero was making, is that the, the Jewish people, 
in in these wars that should have been wiped out to not the, the Jewish world seeing these miracles, knowing how great these miracles are. This is non-belief and disbelief and, and lack of emuna and betachen in Hashem with uh, with vengeance. This isn't just bl- stop mm-hmm. blindness. This is he held blindness of, of, of willful blindness you just don't want to see. You don't want to admit the truth in front of your eyes. Mm-hmm. On a side note, yeah. what's your opinion on Bar Goldstein? Um, well, I, I was uh, very close with a secular journalist Jew in Eretz Israel named Barry Hamish. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He tells a wildly different story in his, perhaps the greatest investigative journalist anywhere in our generation, maybe several generations. He passed away. He was living in Florida. It's too bad because you're there. You could have interviewed him. You could have talked to him. He died a year or two ago, a year and a half. I mean, I think I heard the story in Kafar Tepoch on how the Arabs were planning for another revolt to murder tons of Jews, and he heard about this. Like, is it similar to that? It, that's not what Barry Hamish said. The story I heard is exactly what you said when the day it happened. I remember vividly the day I was at home here in L.A., and uh, I followed the news of this event, and very shortly after that I happened to meet a Chabad uh, Jew, a Jewish family. The man was living in Orange County, and he, I happened to meet him, I don't know how uh, or why, <laughs> it's Minish Amayim. and he told me that he had been living till just recently in Har Bracha and in Har Tepuach, and some, no, in Har Bracha, and somebody from Har, uh, from, from Tepuach sent him a fax telling him this story that the, the, the Muslims were stockpiling in the mosque, in the Marza Machpelah, in the, the tomb of the patriarchs, they had been massing weapons for two or three weeks. They had been walking in the streets saying, If you slaughter the Jew, and they were ready to go, they picked Purim. And supposedly, Borch, uh, uh, Borch, um, uh, Goldstein, Goldstein had, had not snapped and become crazy. He just was most nephish. He went in there, and he put a stop to it so the pogrom against the Jews wouldn't happen. And he gave his life. If all of that is true, it's a myth of what he did. He's a hero for all time. It's just not the story that really happened, and Barry Hamish proved that story to us when he visited here from Eretz Israel uh, a few years uh, or a year or two later and showed us uh, things and uh, told us things of what really went on that day. If you want to hear it, I'll tell it to you. It takes uh, just uh, two minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Borach Goldstein was a settler and a strong uh, follower of Marikahana. I've uh, I've seen video of him eulogizing uh, uh, Marikahana from before he was killed. Obviously, you can't eulogize him after he's killed. Uh, so I had seen videos of him. I know what he looks like. I know what he sounds like. And he was very level-headed. He was a doctor. He helped everybody. He helped Arabs even, even though... There are bitter enemies, and we hate him right back, and he's a communist. He helped Arabs. He saved Jewish uh, Arab kids' lives, etc. And they tell the story that he'd snapped because of all the death and everything, and, and therefore he lashed out. That's not the story. The story is the uh, Shabak, or the IDF, or whoever is responsible for this, comes from all the way up. They want to discredit the settlers. They've tried very hard over very few, a lot of issues, including the Rabin assassination, which is also not as it's been reported and documented or whatever historically written down. Uh, it's also it's all to discredit uh, the the right, etc., in Israel, so that the, the left can win politically. And it's all it's it stems from way back. This is their modus operandi that they always go to to get their way and to keep in power. And what they did was here, they want to do the peace process, Oslo into 93, part of it was given away, at least about nine-tenths of Hebron, and it was being blocked and was being resisted, and the only way to do it is to get some tragedy, some scandal that disgraces the, le- the right so that they, have, they won't be able to open their mouth and the whole country will be angry at them and then give away the land. That's their, that's their modus operandi. That's what they did here. They called him an hour earlier. He usually went on rounds to sick or whatever people around 5 o'clock, the jeep that picked him up picked him up an hour earlier at 4 a.m. 
took him to the back of the mosque, not the front of the, of the mosque, the, the, the Mars of Machpela, opened the door. There were already Arabs in there, in that, what, whatever they use as their prayer area, and I think in Yitzhak's uh, section. And he opened the door with a key, this guy that drove him there, and then he pushed uh, Borch in. He, that officer, shot up the people that died and closed the door and locked Borch in there and trapping him and uh, and uh, framing him. And it's consistent with the ballistics. I don't know how Barry Hamish found out the ballistics. Somebody on the inside gave him the ballistics tables. There were two different rifles, not the same rifle. Borch Gordstein carried an Uzi or whatever, and the other guy had a different rifle. The ballistics that showed his bullets, Borch Goldstein, were the wounds that were ricocheted off the ceiling or off the floor, which he was shooting that he's under instruction when in danger, not to shoot to, to kill, but to shoot to get them to get scared and back back away. And so that's where his bullets were. Whoever died from a frontal shot was this other guy's rifle. And that's mm -hmm. the true story, according to Barry Hamish. Well, it's on YouTube now, so <laughs> great. Well, it's it's been oh, well. out there for years on Barry Hamish's website. People, I, uh -huh. I, uh, in, in his books that he published, I, uh, I, uh, uh, what you might call it, I, um, I invite people to check it out. The website's still up. Awesome. Do you have a website or a page? Uh, I, can direct I, I have a to? Facebook uh, page. I don't have a website. I have uh, videos on YouTube. I have two uh, accounts on Facebook, one with my picture on it, one with a sticker of Kahana Chai, uh, or Kach on it, uh, Moshe Perry, P-A-R-R-Y. And um, I welcome anybody's feedback or comments on this. 